very good. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cricket Podcast with me, Jack Hope, Ross Legg. How are you doing, Ross? I am very well, thanks, Jack. <laughs> good, good, uh, good pause at the start there, mate. Uh, how are you? Yeah, I am. I am not too bad as well. And <laughs> Max Roe Brown. Hello. <laughs> is this how we're going to do the whole thing? Uh, y- yes. C- could take about 50% longer than normal. The, the most professional start to a cricket podcast yet um, <laughs> by, by us. <laughs> um, on this week's episode of the show, it's a little bit of an odds and sorts episode. There's no international cricket happening. There's a little bit of PSL going on. Um, the Big Bash League's gone mental. Um, and... <laughs> And we we do we do quite a well, sort of forty minute interview with Chris Nash, the um, ex Sussex and Nottinghamshire batsman. Uh, Ross, we just finished chatting with Chris. What did what did you think of uh, of Nash Dog? Uh, he he didn't disappoint, did he? Well, at, at all. Had some fantastic stories um, and just got a bit of a different vibe. It was kind of uh, it was kind of like you were in a changing room with someone you'd played cricket with for ages. So it was uh, yeah, really really good fun. Yeah, it's it's definitely um, it's definitely the most not safe for work interview we've done so far <laughs> yeah. so, excellent yeah and uh, he, he doesn't hold back as well so he insults alex hales um <laughs> St- it was St- milani uh luke who right. insult luke right yeah luke fletcher yeah they, they, no, no, yeah no no one's really safe are they jason well, lurie gets some i'm yeah. sad i missed it but i'm looking forward to catching up probably the mm-hmm. most disgusting story i've heard on on the show um towards the end of that interview <laughs> <laughs> wow Big so it's definitely definitely worth listening to, um, Max. Uh, you're looking very very well. Um, you didn't turn up for the interview, which is disappointing of everyone. Um, so what are you bringing to the show this week, Max? Just my usual uh, joie de vivre. <laughs> oh yes, I can tell. I can tell from the tone of your voice, um, boys. As as we do with every every episode of of the cricket podcast, we kick off with um, a question. This week's question um, to celebrate basically a good tweet I did. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm asking you, what is the most beautiful artistic thing that you've ever seen on a cricket field, Ross? Um, so, are you talking about in professional cricket or when I've been on a cricket Any field myself? Any level of cricket that you've seen. Um, so there was one bit where uh, where there was a guy called Harry Smith who he used to play cricket with, and this guy, a bit heavy set, maybe kind of seventeen, eighteen stone, and <laughs> relatively short. Um, but he had unbelievably good hands. Like he was an incredible wicket keeper. Um, but at that point, there was uh, he was fielding at gully or kind of third slip, um, and this guy flashed at one, and the ball was rocketing through gully. Next thing you know, Harry is full length. He's, he's horizontal in the air and takes a one-handed catch, and he looked. It was the the world stood still for that small part, and then rocked when he landed. But it was it was an unbelievable bit of cricket and. Uh, yeah, probably the most um, elegant thing I'd seen in a cricket field, the most beautiful thing I've seen on a cricket field. Max Roy Brown, can you top Harry's full-length dive? Well, it's actually, uh, I guess, a nice um, juxtaposition to the pure art form of elegance. Um, I think I don't know if I've mentioned this story before on the on the podcast or not, but if, even if I have, it's probably worth bringing out again. Um, it was a couple of seasons ago, and uh, we were a little uh, light on bodies for our for our team. Uh, so I got in touch with a, a mate of mine who had been, well, he'd, he'd sort of said uh, a few times in the past. Oh yeah, and no, I used to I used to play a bit. I was I was I was quite uh, I was quite good. I haven't played for a while, but I'd be really up for getting back to it. So if you know if you ever need any players, let me know. So I dropped him a line, and sure enough, he was up for it. So that was good. I thought we <laughs> thought we had something in our back pocket. Um, I, this I was, has got danger written all over yeah, it. I was a little less this has got danger written all over it. I was a little less confident that we had something in our back pocket when uh, I had to pick him up from uh, Sports Direct on the way to the game because he'd had to go and buy some new trousers and spikes. And well, at least he was getting spikes. Yeah, yeah, at least he was getting spikes. That's a heavy investment for and one it's game. The, uh, it's, it's the spikes that he put to really good use, actually. Uh, so, uh, some way through the first innings when we were fielding, he was chasing a ball down to third man and put his spikes onto a, uh, a drain cover, promptly slipped, s- took about three, three stages of stumbling to go down and then ended up actually uh, digging a hole into his new spikes while uh, flailing around and landing on the floor. 
And um, so a man falling over is the most beautiful thing you've ever seen on a cricket field. It's diff- it's difficult to describe how wonderful it was to watch in uh, it, it's sort of live because it was it was stunning. It won champagne moment of the year for the club. Um, and what an uh, I think honor. it summed up it summed up the season perfectly actually because it was a bad year and uh, it was I, t- I tell you what I tell you who's lucky in all of this guys is Max's girlfriend when she receives a Valentine's Day card and goes you are so beautiful to me <laughs> and that is Max's Max's definition of beauty uh, Lizzie is very lucky that was that was, uh, that was my definition <laughs> of art not not beauty okay and the art uh, Jack, was comedy Jack what about you I think um Stuart Broad edging edging Ashton Agar to first slip and then styling out the 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 well being given not out um, because it works on multiple levels. There's lots of different art forms going in that into that, isn't there? There's the there's the grace of the the delivery. Um, it kicks up, it spins. Um, there's the shape that Broad gets into, and then there's the catch, which are all like quite fluent body movements, um, which uh, with your eyes you can appreciate. Um, <laughs> but then, but then on top of that, you've got a great acting performance from Stuart Broad to sell that I didn't hit it, even though it's gone to first slip. And it's not like, oh, maybe it flicked the pad or something. His bat's like eight yards away from his body. Um, it's definitely it could only have been his bat. But he 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 commits to it. It's Academy Award worthy. And acting, you know, so it's it's one of the oldest arts, isn't it? Back in ancient Greece, people put on plays. And Stuart Broad on the cricket field that day, he was just continuing a long trend of 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 human expression in in that in that form. And then Max, as you as you sort of say, um, there was there was a great comedy to the moment, wasn't there? In this case, the comedy largely Schadenfreude. <laughs> 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 there, there is something beautiful about watching all the Australians, especially Michael Clark, completely lose their temper in under a second. Yeah, and then after that, there's lots of lots of writing about that incident. Um, the journalists, they again, lost their shit. Another yeah. art form that is underappreciated in this world, and, and we're talking about it now, oral storytelling, um, <laughs> which again is art. So I think that's probably the most beautiful thing that's ever happened, um, let alone let alone on a cricket pitch. <laughs> Ross. It's a strong case you've made. <laughs> mm-hmm. Ross, is there anything our listeners need to know? Uh, there is indeed. Um, they need to know where to find us on social media, and that is at the Cricket Pod on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and we would like you to recommend the podcast to a friend, share it. We love having more listeners. We love having all the interaction we get on the on social media. Um, and we'll be answering a few questions uh, later on in the show. Um, including Chris Brightwell's question for Chris Nash in our interview. <laughs> um, shall we have a quick break and then come back with the Big Bash rule changes? Now on to a segment that we're calling Cricket News. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, we How had did you come up with that? It's, um, <laughs> well, I, I, what I did was I took um, the topic, cricket, and then I bolted on the descriptor for what what we're going to talk about which is news um and i came up with cricket news a bit like cricket business or business cricket would you remember that for a while we had <laughs> anyway so, oh, i've actually got a bit i've got a bit on business cricket that one i've got a bit on okay business well cricket. let's let's go through it in order of um it probably important or or just in the order we've got written down here um ross you you teased that we'd be talking about the big bash rule changes yeah, it's, it's not the most exciting thing when someone talks about rule changes, but T20 as a format is relatively simple. I mean, the 100 is going off and doing its own thing because it's a bit too complicated, apparently. Um, the Big Bash, uh, the Australian T20 competition, um, and the organisers have decided to add a bit of, um, I don't know, it's like really shit Christmas decorations to a perfectly fine tree. Um, Max, you are king of the rules on this podcast. You probably an umpire in a previous life. Um, and maybe so, you probably wrote to... the rules in a previous life. Quite quite possibly. Quite possibly. I didn't write these ones. <laughs> uh, Max, what are the changes um, that the Big Bash has proposed and is going to be in for Big Bash 10? Big Bash 10. Yeah, what an anniversary gift that is. Um, <laughs> where would you like to start? Would you like to start with A, the power surge, B, the X factor, or C... The bash boost. 
because apparently yeah. I think with what's you know what's a rule change without some alliteration as well. You go with what sounds worst first. So the power a power surge generally not a good thing. Very often, or, or, or it's very rare actually that people in charge of the power. Uh, the electricity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, they're, not, they're not looking for a surge yeah, of power. Yeah. Very power rarely surge, will they say good news, yeah. everyone. A power surge. You happened. buy. <laughs> you you buy specifically buy extension cables that protect against power surges, don't you? There's, it's a, a certifiably bad thing. We'll start. Let's start with that. I think that's the first one they mention as well on their little promo poster. So that's fine. The power surge. So you know, in 2020 cricket, right? You have a power play. Yep. The power play is six overs, and there are some fielding restrictions in it. Yeah. Uh, what about, right, if instead of it being six overs, you make it four overs, but then there's an extra two overs where the batting team can decide to take those two overs when they like, but only if it's after the 11th over. How does that sound? W- wonderfully convoluted, isn't it? Yeah, like, what, yeah I, they, think, they, they... I think you've hammed this up. No, basically, it's, it's not like... as complicated as you've made it sound. No, what? it's not. <laughs> no, it's like basically instead of <laughs> instead of six over power play, you have a four over power play, and then the other two, the bang team, decide when they want them. But mm-hmm. they have to choose it after the eleventh over, which is my issue with this. So I actually don't think, in of itself, having a split power play of four overs and two overs is a bad idea. I think actually it has some merit. So like say for example, we saw it a couple of times in the IPL. Delhi Capitals were naught for three. And they've wasted their entire power play. If you keep two overs back and you can say, we'll take them a bit later on when whoever's come in has got a bit settled, um, it kind of keeps the game a little bit more alive, I'd say. It gives you a little a bigger chance of a comeback. But also, why not also just allow the teams that are doing well in the power play to have their full power play rather than just pointlessly take it away? Like, if you just let them take it whenever they want rather than the stupid 11th over like stipulation, actually... Not, I don't have a huge problem with that, but it's just makes it. Do you know what, mate? It's just dumb as shit. Uh, There's no other way to put it. I love that how riled up Max gets about this because it makes no impact in our life whatsoever. You don't need to go into this much detail. Just say it's a shit idea. It is. I mean, like, what's going to happen is that every single team is going to use it for the 19th and 20th (laughs) over and try and hit the ball out of the park. Yeah. You but, can't, it's not It's not even, as far as I understand, a thing where they can be like, oh, we want to target that bowler, so, you, bowler, so you've declared you're going to bowl yeah. Pie McPie face, and now... <laughs> Karen like, Pollard bowling the 13th over, yeah. we're going to have that one. And now J. Russ is going to hit him at the park. No, it's complete, it's, it's, it's utter fluff. I don't understand. So, so on a cricketing level, it doesn't really make sense because it, it, it kind of debalances the game. It makes something that works crap. Um... And adds really kind of nothing tactically. Um, yeah. From a spectator's point of view, because of all that, it's not interesting. Um, and actually, it might make the game slightly more boring. So one of the, I think part of the reason they may, may be doing this is because traditionally in T20 cricket, over 7 through 12 are considered to be a little bit dull. So, you know, teams yeah. might not try and hit every ball for four. This isn't going to fix that, though. Yeah, no, it's, take the it's, power it doesn't. Do, it, what it actually probably does is just extends that. So people are like, well, we're going to use 19 and 20 to go ballistic. So instead of not trying to lose a wicket between 7 and 12, now well, don't try and lose, lose a wicket, wicket between, between 5 and 12. Um, yeah. do, you know, do you know how we know this is a bad idea? The brains that is Usman Khawaja has come out and said... <laughs> This is this is going to make cricket too confusing for everyone. He knows. If he knows it, everyone else knows. Um, could you improve it before we move on to the next one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, yeah. I've got. I've, got I've had my. I said my piece, and I was saying I'd, what I said about. I don't think it's a terrible idea, but you should. If you're going to give the batsman, the batting team, the flexibility, then there's no. Why would you then restrict what they're allowed to do with that flexibility? That's just stupid. But yeah, Ross, what 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 do you think? It's a bit of a crazy idea, but hear me out here. I would make them have the power play in the first six overs of the innings. <laughs> P- pretty, pretty crazy. Yeah. Right. I would. Um, I if you, right. Do, have you given any precedent for that? <laughs> have you, has, has that worked anywhere in the past? <laughs> Seriously, I think you're right, Ross. But if you have to have a gimmick, I think, mm-hmm. and it has to have a name. I think you've got two options: um, maximum power. The whole 20 overs are a power play. <laughs> <laughs> or power wheel. Um, you spin oh, okay. it. 
<laughs> That's exactly what you do. You the have game. at Brilliant. the beginning of the game, you spin it, and then two random, or all the random overs, or whatever, like they're just random power plays throughout it to make it as confusing as possible. Um, but that's, yeah, there you go. But then the women and children would understand it, wouldn't they? Oh, it's that's, that's obvious, that's so obvious now. Uh, Max, X Factor. X Factor. So <laughs> the power surge is definitely the best idea of the three. <laughs> just going just gonna to float that out there. <laughs> the X Factor. So um, basically what, what happens with that is that after the 10th over of the first innings, teams can sub in one of their players that they've named as their 12th or 13th man to replace someone who hasn't done very much. Now, when I say done very much, they can't have batted and they're allowed to have bowled a maximum of one over. Now, obviously the X factor, as it's named, gives the suggestion that you would do that to bring in a star player, someone who's going to change the game. Now, what I would do as a coach of a team with my X factor player is play them in my team. (laughs) And not put them on the bench and bring them in for half, halfway through an innings. I, I mean, that's, I, that might be crazy. That might, you know, Dan Weston might say the stats on that don't work. But from my point of view, that's. Well, I, I'm, 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 back, I'm backing you here, Max. Why would you not play that? There is a bit here, though. And Jack, I mean, you, you're kind of edging to talk here. Have, have you, right. Are you thinking that they're going to have a. Uh... So it, I think basically it's a dumb idea. So the super sub in ODI cricket never worked. Both of these ideas are a, a peak. We need to improve ODI cricket 2007 ICC nonsense, basically. The super sub was a complete disaster. Um, and having power plays that were randomly triggered, or not randomly triggered, were triggered by the batting and bowling team. Also a complete disaster because in every single game they were triggered in the, at the same point. <laughs> yep. um, with this one, the, uh, the if you're going to do this, I would actually say go a little bit further. Um, so you, let, let's talk on the X Factor thing. Um, so I, I think one uh, one area where you would actually bring your X Factor player in uh, or, or have them on the bench. So say you've got Chris Gale. Um, I know he's yeah. not allowed in Australia anymore after <laughs> after the incident. <laughs> Uh, but, Don't blush, baby. Um, but if you, I mean, if you had Chris Gale, you could have him on the bench whilst anyone else fielded for the yeah. for the twenty overs, and then bring him in just to bat. Um, taking that idea to the extreme, why not just have a squad of fifteen or thirteen or whatever? Um, you can have more better bowlers, and you can have more better batsmen. And the people who can't really bat or, or good people who can't really field can be replaced by fielders. And yeah. there you, you'd see better bowlers, you'd see better batters, Let's go and you'd see NFL. better fielders. Um, have two teams. If you want to do, if you want to have extended squads. I mean, I, I think this is a particularly stupid idea for the Big Bash, though, because the player pool's quite thin. And it's going to be particularly thin this year because yeah. of COVID. <laughs> Um, well, so it's actually just Australian going to be farms. guys who, from grey yeah, cricket. Who are you going to bring in? Basically, I only see... Uh, well, three. I can see three ways in this will be in which this will be used. You've said what the first one is, Jack, which is basically having an old bloke who's really good, but you don't want fielding, and try and limit the amount of time they have to stand at short third man. That's fine. That's probably not what they're after, but about as close to what they're after as you can get because everyone likes to see um, see Chris Gale batting, but <laughs> him doing other stuff is probably not worth it. Uh, the second one is having a gun fielder for the first ten overs of your fielding innings and then just getting rid of him um you know like, like br- <laughs> can't make any impact in the next 10 and then uh, and the other one is just if someone pulls up lame halfway through an innings and yeah. they get injured i mean i i think that the only thing it might accidentally do is redress the balance of power slightly in in t20 cricket so so most of the time the team batting second wins a t20 match um i, I think it's something like 64 it's quite a significant um, difference because of this super sub rule you could as the team batting first really go ballistic knowing that you can you could maybe bring in some more bowlers after 10 overs if things are going really well or maybe bring in a few couple more power hitters if things aren't going so well and whereas the team fielding probably has slightly less tactical flexibility so so you might yeah. actually see a slight rebalance there i think it's really not the way to go about it um, but it might I don't know I, I can't see this lasting you're trying to find season. something positive to take out of it I think it's really I think, I think I think you're both missing a trick here Max you almost got there or Jack you, with the Chris Gale thing I reckon that the, the Australians the Big Bash doesn't make as much money as they want it to they love the likes of Shane Warne Glenn McGrath 
Ricky Ponting, Matthew Hayden, Gilchrist. Oh, we're going to bring what back about an old school this, superstar. What about if this is a legend? <laughs> the, the X Factor is about bringing in legend cricketers. That's good. They can't, I, they can't field phrases, can they? That improves it. I that would, you can <laughs> that would, be, that that, would yeah. be definitely better yeah. than what they've got now. Right, Max, give me a bash boost. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the bash boost. So, you know how conventionally in a game there are two teams. One mm-hmm. team wins and gets some points and the other team loses and doesn't get any points. What about yep. within the game, you have a game that ends halfway through the game and the winner of that game at the halfway stage gets a point. This is the this is the most heinous of the ideas. It is unbelievably stupid. So basically, yeah, that well, that, that's what it is. So they take the scores of the two teams halfway through their innings, and whichever one is doing better after ten overs gets a point. It's just what? dumb, isn't it? There's not even you can't I, even why? improve that. What what, what is that improving? T- what is that what? fixing? What why why, why don't they just play T ten? <laughs> it's clear they've got this issue with T20 cricket. Two innings of T10. Why don't they just play the 100? <laughs> yeah. I think it's a licensed product now. Oh. Um, oh. Yeah, I, I mean, if you really wanted to, if you really wanted to innovate, I think there are a couple of things you could do. I, I think genuinely you could have bigger bonus squads. Bonus point for most sixes. Oh no! Maybe? Fuck the bonus point, mate. That's a, that's a dumb idea. That's if you want to play with the points, it? though, if, like, you don't need to play with the points. Points are you fine. You don't need to because it's binary win to. or lose situation. <laughs> Like, yeah, there's, there's, yeah. Um, if you wanted to make some improvements or, or be radical, having more players eligible to play without a super sub rule, so everybody gets thirteen players, everyone will therefore play five bowlers and maybe someone who can bowl a little bit. Maybe maybe mm-hmm. people will bowl six, play six bowlers and a bunch of batters. You'll see more shots. You'll see get a quality of bowling. I think that would be a differentiator from other leagues. I think it probably would mean that the standard was kind of improved slightly. Um, but the other thing I think you could do, um, which you, we wouldn't even have to change the number of players. I mean, this is really crazy. Um, why not have people who can bowl more than one over in a row? Specialize. Oh, Jack. I don't think... No, I think that's a good idea. We've I think gone, if you wanted to... We're going full 100 here. No, I'm not saying that. I, what I'm saying <laughs> is that in, in T20 cricket, more and more regularly, what you see are people specialising in certain aspects of the game. Wouldn't it be quite good if you got to see Trent Bolt bowl four overs right at the beginning of a, of a T20 match and then four overs of Rashid Khan, 10 to 14? Like You'd actually yeah. have spells, and I, I, I think that, that could be an improvement that... Um, I don't know. Might change things, but I don't. I, I, I like it's, all of these things are really gimmicky and really yeah. not very well thought through. Well, and, and I, I, don't I don't think, think maximise skill. No, I don't think. I mean, even that change you suggest, I don't think that's necessary. But it is a better idea than all of the other ideas that that they've put with. I mean, do we have anything more to say on the, no. on the bone bash bonus, whatever bollocks it is, bash boost, bash bollocks? Um, but okay. <laughs> bash bollocks. Bash bollocks. That's, a, that's probably a better way of encompassing no. the description of all three changes. I think we I'd... wrap the big bash league now. Well, we yeah, might cover well, a little I bit. Just, but... I just had one final thing to say on it, which is sort of um, that might kind of uh, sort of elucidate where this might have come from and um, why why this has all happened. So there's a, there's a man called Trent Woodhill who had his say on, well, what, what this is about because he was involved in these changes and he is described <laughs> as the big bashes player um well i can't remember what the first bit is but the second bit is cricket consultant and that's uh that's a key thing you need to know the consultants have got their grubby mitts all over this ross Ma- max do you want to know something else yeah that trent woodhill came up on the interview with chris nash that you weren't a part of yeah. did he so, yeah, there you go he, he's a big name in cricket by the time chris nash called him the ugliest parties. man ever <laughs> well he's got a lot to answer for all right so I'll, I'll just read what he said right and it kind of just sort of tells you what the what the thinking is behind this. He said the best T20 leagues across the globe are the ones that continue to innovate, push the boundaries, and challenge the status quo. The introduction of these new playing conditions firmly puts the Big Bash League into that category. So what we're saying is we've made some changes because we want to make some changes because that's <laughs> that's good, right? Um, but I, d- I don't know if you've heard of this this league called the IPL, which is the best 2020 league in the world, or at least the biggest and the most uh, successful. In that that really convoluted competition, you've got eight teams that play each other home and away at 2020 cricket. Um, The winners get two points and the losers don't get any points. And um, and then the teams who are best at all the cricket then do a knockout to see who wins. And... um, 
Sounds like a pretty good format, Max. Yeah. I'm going to have to take this rule book away lots from of, you, I think. <laughs> lots of innovation. <laughs> uh, okay, well, uh, let's wrap up the Big Bash there. It's very stupid. Um, it's classic, classic cricket. That is, to be perfectly honest, trying to change something that is not broken. Um, cricket business, however, IPL. Crick biz. IPL. The, I'm pushing it. Crick biz. Get, how surprised are you that the IPL this year is the most viewed of all time? No one else got anything else to do, have they? Other than watch the cricket. Absolute, of course, it's going to be the shocked Ross. I can't believe it. Thank you. For I think it's tonight. probably it's probably our podcast, right? I imagine probably, putting yeah, it to the masses. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Other T Twenty news. This is back to cricket news. We've done cricket beers. Um, now, now to actual cricket. Um, today, the Pakistani Super League concluded. The Lahore Kalanders. Do you know that's how you say that? Is it? I do know how to say it. Or, yeah. or calendars. Might be calendars. One of those. I, I went. I I thought calendars would be. Well, I was it, calling but... them quailanders, like quaaludes, but it's definitely not. <laughs> it's definitely not that. It's it's yeah. Anyway, Lahore took on the Karachi Kings in the Pakistani Super League final. Um, they Lahore batted first, and it it turned out to be a rather attritional pitch. Nobody got going, and they limped to only 134. The highlight of the first innings was Shaheen Afridi reverse scooping um, Mohamed Amir for four. Did you see that one, boys? No, I don't. But I'm not surprised at anything Shaheen Afridi does. Yeah. He's, he's fantastic. He, he also hit his first six ever in T20 cricket off, <laughs> off of Amir in the last over. Um, of many, I'm sure. In response, the Karachi Kings won really, really easily. Baba Azam scoring some runs. Yeah, well, when you do have Pakistan's best player by a mile, he's always, he's always going to turn Yeah, he's quite way. good, isn't he? Baba. Yeah, but it does, doesn't work for uh, Virat Kohli and Royal Challenge of Bangalore, does it? Um, anyway, uh, does that wrap up all of our uh, pre-Chris Nash cricket news? More or less. There's a, there's a little bit of um, international stuff. Uh, obviously, there, there, have been, there have been some squad announcements for West Indies and New Zealand, which starts next Friday, and Australia v India as well. Um and and England and, and England and South Africa. So the cricket actually does start again next Friday. Um, in all of that, there have been a couple of quite weird stories. Um, starting with probably the slightly less weird one, Virat Kohli has said he will go home after the first test of the India v Australia series. Um, what do you think about that, Max? For for paternity. Yeah, like he's, yeah. he's having a kid, isn't he? So, he's not um, just calling yeah. it a day. He's not, not just had enough. There was there's a fairly good reason behind it. Okay, yeah. so you know, I, no, I, no, no comment on no how that will affect well, things. It's just um... well, Virat Kohli is having a son. Congratulations to him. Hunt son, child, girl, boy. I don't know. Yeah, they're they're typically the option. Yeah. <laughs> they're having a child. <laughs> having a child. Congratulations. Uh, India will be worse. Okay, uh, Ross, have you got anything to add? Uh, no, uh, no, 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 nothing. All right, uh, and, the, and um, Australia have been forced to airlift some of their players out of Adelaide. Have you seen that? No, I've not. So seen there's that. been. Is, it, is this is like I'm a celebrity no, getting out of the jungle? Or a, or is there a fire or what? There has been a COVID outbreak in Adelaide. Um, and, oh, it'd be so good to have a helicopter. And they have they've airlifted Tim Tim Payne uh, and Manus Labuschagne, I think a couple of others, out to some other part of the country that's got no COVID. But they're not sure whether they've been exposed to COVID, so they're now in isolation. And I think possibly. I mean, Tim Payne obviously doesn't play in the white ball stuff. Um, but Marlis Labuschagne might be um, a doubt, I think, for for the first game after the the airlift. Um, I, I don't think cricket has enough airlifts. No, I, I'm kind of picturing like a massive helicopter landing in the middle of Adelaide uh, cricket ground. I was thinking more That's, Berlin oh. airlift. So all the players. Oh, like, really? Right, yeah, you know, like a plane touching down every 35 seconds to pick up another Australian um, <laughs> and take them somewhere. <laughs> Do you, do you reckon what we'll see is uh, uh, Tim Payne's going to end up with some camouflage uh, cricket gloves again? It could be like, oh, the army came and got us at Adelaide. Have to pay my respects. Yeah, well, you never know. Uh, anyway, that's that's cricket news. That is all the cricket news. Um, we are now going to speak or have spoken to to Chris Nasher and um, and and we'll play that. Ross, do you want to do you want to say anything else about that interview? No, I just think it's a great interview around the insight to county cricket and a guy who's played cricket for, what, the last 20 years professionally. Um, what that means in terms of camaraderie and the relationships you build and also some fantastic stories, including Mushtaq Ahmed, Wazi Makram, Inza Mamal Huck and a revolving dance floor. That is, that is, that's a highlight. 
Um, also, the, there's a cat. You'll notice the cat. <laughs> <laughs> We love hearing from our listeners, so please follow us at The Cricket Pod on Twitter and Instagram. Or if you have a great story like Scotty G did about the Hayden Way, Matthew Hayden's personal website, we want to hear about it. So from wherever you're from, send us in a great story and we'll read out on the show. Email us on thecricketpod at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Today we are speaking to a man who has scored nearly 20,000 professional better, runs. Better, much better. <laughs> during an 18-year career. Um, he stressed it was nearly 20,000, so let's get that right off the bat. Well, no, hold on. You said it was eight, just over 18,000, so you did me out of 2,000. That's like that's like you saying I scored 38 and you went, oh, Nashi got 20-odd today. <laughs> Absolutely, that was criminal, and I'm, I'm not having it. But well, he's so keen to demonstrate this hunger of runs um, that he's left Nottinghamshire to go and play in the second division of Sussex um, with a small <laughs> village club. Um, welcome to the show, Chris Nash. How are you doing? Yeah, no, much better now. You got my stats right. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it now. After I've corrected you on that, I mean, your research is pretty shit to start with, so it can only get better from here. Oh, but, uh, to, but are we right in saying that you are going to join a second division Sussex club? I'm going to join the most recent club in Sussex who's won the National Knockout. Oh, that's a nice way of putting it. When, when was that? It was the, We were the last Sussex club side to win it, so that's pretty much all we need to know today. <laughs> <laughs> it's just back in, the, back in the era when Sussex was the only first-class county and, and, and more or less the only county playing cricket. So 1,700? No, no, it was all, all I'm saying is that no team since the team that I played in have won it. You know, Roffey, Preston Nomads, rah, rah, rah. No one's got close to winning it. So that's the club that I'm playing. <laughs> OK, all right. Well, let, let's, let's quickly move on. So uh, yeah. surely ruining third team's dad's and son's weekends isn't all you've got in your locker. Um, you're just 37. Um, so let's ask the obvious question first. Have you still got ambitions to play professionally? Yeah, I, I have. Um and yeah, I mean, I have restricted what I would like to do. So I'm, I'm still looking to play some T20. Um, and again, even restrict it further. I'm looking to kind of be within a few hours of living in Brighton. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's quite selective in what I wanted to do. But in terms of, you know, moving out of cricket eventually, um, that's just the way I've got, I've got to do it. Um, and that was the way I chose. That's where I've chosen to go about it. So, you know, I could have spoken to clubs in you know up north and stuff like that but for me you know moving out of cricket is quite a challenging time mm -hmm. um for anyone especially when you've been in it so long so i had to make a decision um, and take control of what i wanted to do so yeah i'm still um you know having conversations with some of the clubs within kind of striking distance of where i live mm -hmm. um and if anything comes up it'd be lovely to play in front of crowds next year and i'd love to try and win my 30 20 title just Add in another achievement that you might you might have said he, he's won a T20 title and I'm going to say well, I've won two and I'd like to win three. Um, so it sounds like I'm I'm going to make a little bit of a leap of faith and, and suggest that Sussex might be the team that you're you're most interested in in rejoining in in, in your case. So they've had a change of management recently, and uh, is it James Kirtley in charge? Yeah, Kurt Kirtles and uh, Ian Salisbury's there as well. To be honest, it, it's not something that I'm. Um, I would narrow down to just Sussex. It, it's something that I, I feel like, from a personal point of view, I've still got a year or two of cricket left in me. Um, at that level, I was still playing really good cricket last year, and you know, to be to play in that notch team, really, to 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 be in that notch team and opening the batting, I think probably shows. You know, Peter Moores is generally quite a good judge, and I know he he thinks I've got plenty of cricket left in me so um yeah I think it was one of those you have to make a decision at some stage of your career when you do start to um explore your next career which was very important to me um and this opportunity that I've taken now is something that I've got, I had to take but it'd be lovely to finish off and play a bit more cricket yeah fair enough um silly then I mean with the hundred coming up next year if I'm you right now I'm sort of thinking to myself a few overseas players might not be able to make it Dane Villas sold for 125 grand I've got a couple of years more experience than him I would fancy a piece of that action is is that something that you you might end up doing do you think or or are you restricting yourself just to the t20 window do you, do you I, got at all. 
I mean, to be honest with you, um, you know, when the 100 draft happened last year, and I think I've probably been quite a big... I think there was a number of people, you look around you, Josh Cobbs and people like that. I mean, Luke Wright was the last pick. So in terms of the 100, I think I think the auction last year, it wasn't a reflection on a lot of players. Um, and on the flip side, I think it worked the other way as well. And some players got, you know, picked at, you know, brackets, <laughs> which, which weren't right. I mean, geez. <laughs> Wonderful, di- wonderfully diplomatic way of saying that. Yeah, I, I, I was watching that draft, and from a not, you know, nothing to do with me, but I'm watching Luke Wright getting last pick, and Ricky Vessels, and David Milan, and I, I, yeah. So what what would be nice is now there might be a slight reset because people would have played, you know, T20 this year, and you know, I think the coaches maybe involved would have watched a bit more of the T20 this year than they did last year, and I think. You'd like, you know, yeah, I, I would say that in terms of how I go about T20, it would be well suited to the 100. But, um, you know, I'm not the one that really matters. It's the people yeah. pressing the buttons. So, yeah, I would. I, I think I'd be well suited to it. But, um, you know, I'm not the one picking the team, am I? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about you being a county pro then. So uh, you spent your career opening the batting in England. Um, can our listeners assume this is some kind of sadomasochistic kind of streak that extends into other areas of your life? Um, no, I'm not. I'm not a fucking idiot most of the time. <laughs> but I suppose my cricket career, I'm an absolute tosser because, oh, I, I mean, Jesus, opening the batting in England is is shit. Um, <laughs> it is genuinely shit. Um, yeah, I mean, there's not really much more to say. I mean, we play, we, we play with the Dukes ball. We play on county pitches, which generally do quite a lot. Um, you, you're getting hit on the shin by guys, you know, very, very skillful guys. And if it hits the seam, it nips about. So, yeah, I mean, look, if I could go back 20 years and someone said to me, you could bat five or six, I would, I'd probably be a far happier man now. <laughs> um, well, well, how, but, well, how do you approach that? How do, how do you approach knowing that you're going out there, especially as the ECB kind of elongate the season to play pretty much in March? Yeah. How, how, do you, yeah. how do you get mentally ready to go out and bat and know that you've probably got a big zero with your name on it? Yeah, oh, well, thanks for thanks for that. Um, I'm just but, rounding down. You probably get a twenty. Yeah, I know. You, I mean that. You know, a big zero to you is probably eighty to me. Um, to be honest, I mean the one thing is I never opened the batting as a kid. I used to bat nine and ten, so I was a, I was a bit of a slogger as a kid who bowled off spin. So opening the batting only really started in the first team. To be honest, I, I got into the first team, and I, and that was when I kind of opened the batting. So it wasn't like I had a career. A junior career getting used to being shit as opening and then did it as a professional career it was like so I, I approached it differently my view was the ball's hard so the ball goes for four quicker um and most of the fielders are in the slips so there's no one in the covers so i suppose i, I kind of I, I played it as a bit more of a gamble it was uh, it wasn't always in my favor but that was the way i pro- i used to try and hit try and hit boundaries early and, and that was the only way I could really justify the fact that I was doing it for a living, um, that, you know, I could get to 30 really quickly, um, was if I just tried to play like a traditional opener. I'd, Jesus, it'd be, it would have been horrific. And I probably wouldn't, <laughs> you probably wouldn't be ringing me actually interested in what I've got to say. <laughs> but were you basing that game on on someone else or, or were you carving your own groove, so to speak, at, at that point? No, my, my favourite player was Michael Slater. I love watching him bat. So... I suppose as a kid, even though I, I didn't always open the batting, I always liked the way he played. And he was the one player I, you know, used to love watching. Um, he got, I think, he got eighty odd before lunch at Lords once, and I thought, this is cool. I, I like this. So I suppose, um, you know, as a role model, he was the one I looked at and thought I like the way he plays. Um, and then that probably subconsciously transferred into how I played cricket as an opener. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Um... Looking back a couple of years, you you've got quite a, a reasonable um, social media following for for well a, a county cricketer, I, I guess. Um, you used to um, tweet using the hashtag at uh, hashtag County Grind, where where yeah. you where you ask people to guess which service station were you you were at. Um, yeah. Based on that, I've got two questions for you. One, what is your favourite service station? Um, and and two, how. How tongue in cheek is is the phrase "county grind"? Completely tongue in cheek. One one thing. First of all, there's only one service station which can really compare to anywhere. Really, I mean, <laughs> Cobham, Cobham Cobham is world class. 
Oh, I, um, what, he must have been terrible being a, being a younger pro before Cobham opened then. Mate, Cobham, <laughs> like, bear in mind the last three years I've done 30, 38,000 miles and I've been away in the winter. So that's three summers, 38. It's about 12,000 miles a summer. I mean, Cobham was like, oh, I mean, it's about an hour from Cobham. <laughs> like, I drive in and it was like, yeah, oh, wow. Um, so Cobham, Cobham was a game changer. Um, what, sorry, what was your other question? How tongue it? Absolutely, completely tongue in cheek. In that, I think you know some people might take it one way or the other and say, "Oh, he's a bit of a joker and stuff." But if you can't make a bit of light fun at yourself and your position, um, yes, we're professional sportsmen. Yeah, we are. We play cricket for a living. You know, you play county cricket. County cricket is a, is a million miles away from from what I think is international cricket and all of that. And um, you know, I've had little experiences of franchise cricket and stuff like that and it county cricket is its own beast it's 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 its own animal and if you can't poke fun at the the funny things that happen um if you're precious about it geez what's the point so it was it was just about i wanted to show people that it was really bloody funny um the mundane stuff that (laughs) happened it wasn't we we're not these polished um you know professional sports people like you know some of the some of the the crap that goes on on a journey is just, you know, you're eating prawn cocktail sandwiches with some chicken and chili empanadas um, <laughs> and a, and a count on us 150 calorie chocolate muffin mousse. I mean, that was, <laughs> that was my go to meal um, on the way back from a game or going to a game. So it was just you, you might get a jelly or some um, rocky road to, as a bit of a treat, but fuck, it's funny. Like, <laughs> It is fucking hilarious, mate. Honestly, um, if, if we go into that a little bit more detail, what what was your favourite bit about being, or what was your favourite bit of the county season? Um, I, I like just the people you're with. Like fucking, they, you 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 make friendships that you live with these people. You know, like Ed Joyce. Me and Ed Joyce used to room together. He was captain, so he was offered his own room, but he said no because we had such a nice time. <laughs> and, like, you, you, he just wanted to be Little Spoon, didn't he, really? Yeah, it was. <laughs> it, we, oh, it was a single room. But, just <laughs> two, um, but like, I, like, we would stay at the castle in Taunton, and like, it was like an old people's home, like floral bed sheets and stuff like that. And me and Joycey were there, and we would both go to the shop on the way home and normally it was like chocolate buttons and you'd always get some giant buttons or something. And he just came back and bought me some milk tray and just put it on my bed. And (laughs) you're just sitting there eating milk tray, like in your boxes, watching TV and you're thinking, you know, and there was, it wasn't even a flat screen. It was a little box TV on a little side. And this was like five years ago. And you just, (laughs) you just piss yourself. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) some of the shit that you do and and you sit in these rooms and you're just like, what are we doing with our lives? But, (laughs) Um, you know, <laughs> I remember. I remember actually. As I was captain at Sussex, and I had to drop a player, um, but I was rooming with him because obviously, we, you know, budgets aren't always that big. And I was sharing a room with a player. I dropped him in the morning, and then room with him in the evening. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it, situations which people probably don't even imagine happen in county cricket. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> some of the stuff. I'm, I'm, I remember driving up to pick Mushtak Armin up, and he said, "Come in, come in." And um, I went into this house, this huge house down in Hove. And I walked in and like Inza Marmel Hark was there, Wazzy Macrab, all these absolute legends were there. Um, and in the house he was in, it was called the White House um, down in Hove. And it was a huge house. He was a massive cricket fan. And this old house was quite dated. Mm-hmm. And in it, he had a revolving dance floor. <laughs> so I walk into this house and I think, I can't remember who, a couple of lads were with me. And I've gone to pick Mushy up to take him to Worcester. And he goes, no, no, come in, come in, come in. We're just about to eat. And I'm thinking, shit, we're going to be late here. So here we are. We're sitting around this revolving dance floor and all this food is going around on the dance floor. <laughs> you know, like when, when you're in like the, ta- in like, I don't know. Uh, uh, it's a lazy Susan. <laughs> yeah. And the food's just rotating around and you're picking off some oceans. I mean, the food was unbelievable. And then I, I, don't, I think I took Mushy up and we were, we were so late. And I remember turning up late and I think Morsey was like... He, ended up, he had to bollock me because we were late. And I was like, and I didn't say anything. I was only a young player. And then like Mushy went up and apologised. And yeah, just, you just sit there. It's just these surreal situations. And Wazim Akram's sitting there and Inzi. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Um, 
eating food off a revolving dance floor. Um, yeah. So that, that's, that's, that's <laughs> such an obscure sketch. If you had like a cricket sketch <laughs> show, that, that was what you'd have. Mate, I, honestly, like some of the stuff, yeah, you just have those moments and you think like the average person wouldn't have a clue that this goes on. But yeah, it, it's just funny. And it's some of it is completely budget. Like we used to have a, one of our sponsored car was a Fiat Doblo and it, we, we put in ice cream stickers. It looked like an ice cream van. So we put like, ice cream stickers in it. And it just looked, we used to drive to away games in basically an ice cream van. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, I just go off on a tangent. <laughs> I absolutely love that. Uh, is, is there a format that you and the kind of players more generally in the county game want to win the most? Does the T20 competition stand out or do people actually love the county championship? Genuinely, the county championship is the most rewarding competition by. To, to sit at the end of the season, I mean, just winning a four-day game. I mean, we didn't do it for a while with Knots, but um, to, to win a four-day game, to sit there, you know, covered in dust, sweat, have a few beers with your mates. But, well, I mean, winning the championship in my first two years, kind of in the first team with Sussex, was I was spoiled because they were the best days ever when, when you won it. You know, you'd have a week of celebrating where you'd just be pissed for a week. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but, I mean, the, the T20 was special to get to finals day. Um, amazing times and a Lord's final is obviously special but to, for pure inner satisfaction the championship is out of this world because the best team always wins in my opinion um, of, of the old format anyway um, and it's the hardest work mm-hmm. So we're we'll staying on the subject of the county championship um, you would have spent plenty of days waiting for the rain to kind of come back another day um, what was the best way that you found someone or yourself to pass the time. I mean, does change your room cricket extend into the professional game? It does massively. Like, genuinely, like, I, I can't be arsed with it. Like, I would always sit there and people would be playing and, like, people play for hours. You know, they, I've, play, I've seen cards. I don't play cards. I don't play indoor cricket. I prefer to just sit there. Like, me and Wrighty would lounge about in the changing room and just talk absolute drivel. Um, <laughs> and that was kind of just talking abuse or, you know, someone would start asking stupid questions, which I won't even repeat. <laughs> someone would ask questions about something and you had to, you had to choose one option or the other. I mean, fine. Yeah, I think we can read between the lines on some of those. <laughs> some, some of the inane chat, I'm just once has popped into my mind. It's fucking ridiculous. Um, the inane chat was ridiculous. So yeah, I, I used to kind of like to just lay down um, and talk drivel. I wasn't really into it, but some of the lads played corridor cricket for hours, you know, um, that's probably why I wasn't that good. <laughs> what, is that what, at indoor cricket or just in cricket in general? No, I mean in cricket because like that's probably where people learn to play spin. So that's probably why I was shit against spin. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should pay more attention to it. But anyway, I, I was good at talking shit. If we, um, if we, if we move well, things forward to to this cricket season. Um, one of one of the classic jokes about county cricket is that you you basically play in front of of nobody. Um, this this season, you literally did play in front of nobody. Um, how weird was that? But uh, mate, it was the best feeling in the world when when you didn't get any runs. It was so good because if you were, if you were being shit, if you were doing rubbish, you weren't getting abused. Like, I'm, I'll never forget last the season before end of the season. I was a bit shot to pieces. Um, and I, I think Darren Stevens got me out of LBW and I left it. It was, I mean, it might've been missing leg. It was that shit. <laughs> um, and like, I, I remember walking back in, it was right at the end of the season and we'd had a stinker and some bloke right at the top of Trent Bridge was like, at least play a fucking shot. You're fucking useless. And I remember thinking, <laughs> and I, so I went and sat in the change room and I thought like some old bloke who probably couldn't even see the middle. has just a beautiful, <laughs> Um, and yeah, so mate, when I got out, like I got out a couple of times in the, in the Bob Willis stuff and you walked in and there's no one there to abuse you. It was quite refreshing actually. Um, so yeah, when you were crap, it was good. But obviously when you get runs, um, there wasn't anyone there. The T20 the was crap without crowds, really. Yeah. Let's be honest. You play for the crowds, the buzz, you know, the, the highs and the lows. Like we were playing games, even our quarter final against Leicester felt like a bloody, you know, it was, it was about two degrees, no one there. October the 1st, it was, you know, we won it. But look, I'm not going to lie, like, it was, you know, some of it was was pretty, pretty shit. Yeah, yeah I, if we go back to that incident at, at Trent Bridge, I mean, you actually tweeted earlier this season, or oh, uh, earlier this year, and this is research, 
Um, this, is, this is your tweet. If we have to play behind closed doors, I'm going to miss the old boy on, uh, on the top tier telling me how crap I am and 10 minutes later asking me to sign a picture of Graham Swan. Um, so yeah. we, we can read between. I think it doesn't sound like you missed him. Um, <laughs> but why did he want you to sign a photo of Graham Swan? And did you sign it? <laughs> no, because people think I look a bit like Graham Swan. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, but that, that's... He must be blind. I'm, no, he was blind. Um, probably not as blind as me on that game. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and then, so you, you'd walk through the crowd, especially at Trent Bridge and at Hove, actually, you'd walk through the crowd and they would be, they would abuse the crap out of you. And the next time you walk out, they're there with all these photos. You just <laughs> And you can see them and they look at you. Or what, What's great about county supporters is they genuinely think that players are fucking idiots. <laughs> um, like I used to sit, I used to sit, feel at Deep Square at home in front of the committee box and there was a group of guys and they, used to, they were sitting five yards from me and I remember it really well. And they used to sit there and talk to each other and abuse you in their conversation, knowing that I can probably hear, but thinking that I wouldn't, come around turn around and I turned around one day and I was like I completely agree with you I'm fucking useless aren't I <laughs> and honestly the looks on their faces were like it was absolute panic because they were they, they talk loud enough so you can hear mm-hmm. but also quiet enough so they probably think that you would never say anything but I used to just turn around and go I completely agree mate I need to get my fucking front pad out of the way or something like that or yeah I'm shit in April or something like that so um yeah County supporters, they would they would just talk loud enough so you could hear, and you're like, mate, just say it to my face. I yeah. honestly couldn't give a shit. <laughs> it's like kind of critics' corner, isn't it? It's just that bit where these guys probably never played a day of cricket in their life, and they're sitting there because their missus have bought them a season pass to get them out of the house. <laughs> yeah, and that, you know they, they all have their say. And don't don't get me wrong, I love county supporters. They're what make it. There's, they've made my life. Mm-hmm. Um, I've I've met some great ones. I've met some interesting ones. Um, they're the weird and wild, they're weird and wonderful society, um, and I love them to bits for it. But yeah, some of them I just wish they would be like Nashi, you're shit, and or you were brilliant, whatever. Just say it to me, and I'm happy. So, you, I'm, you, you know, you, so you'd like to play in kind of front of uh, the Eric Holly stand on T20 T20 finals day, where everyone's just hurling abuse at whoever's right in front of them. <laughs> Mad for it. I love it because, and I know, you know, plenty of people, I think it's, if, you, if, you, if you take it to heart and you go internal, like you've got to have a giggle with the crowd. Like mm-hmm. that's my best fun is turning around, having a bit of banter. Like you drop a catch, have a laugh because otherwise it eats you away. Um, you know, I've, I've had some right laughs, you know, at the Oval, places like that where the crowds get really raucous and you get stuck in with them and they love it. So and they end up, you know. What, what's Alex Hales like? So when I was at Edgebaston for England versus Australia, he was over there in the England when he was filming for England, and he was the dampest squib going, <laughs> like completely, like so boring, didn't engage at all. Aaron Finch comes out for Australia and is the best laugh you've ever had next to the next to the crowd. Like, what, what's up with Halesy? Because I mean, if you if you're to believe the media, he's a bit of he's quite good fun. He's a miserable bar. I live with him in the summer. Actually, he's a miserable bastard. Really. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Maybe he just hasn't got any banter, really. <laughs> but bless Baz, I, I love him. He's a legend. I just think he's, he's just got no ban, if I'm being honest. That's um, going to be the Twitter clip, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But like, hey, he's got nothing, really. Like, yeah, I, I had a good time living with him, but that's because I could just abuse him and he gave me nothing back. So, yeah, basically, Baz has got no ban. So when he's with the crowd, he's, um, yeah, he doesn't say anything. He's yeah. just this like, He's just this lanky streak of piss with big ears. <laughs> so, yeah, he hasn't, he hasn't got a lot in his lockers. So that's, he just keeps quiet, I think, because he knows if he tries to go back with them, they, he's got no banter to go with them. Oh, Alex Hales is going to have to come on here now. Uh, anyway, <laughs> let's, let's, let's move on to yeah, that. That would be, be 45 minutes of absolute hilarity. <laughs> Yeah, I reckon he'll definitely know his batting stats. Uh, when, when, when it comes to um, T20, you've kind of been playing professional cricket for more or less the entire existence of T20. Um, when did you and other players realise it wasn't just going to be a gimmick and it was going to be like the future of cricket? Um, I mean, 2003 it started. I, I started playing 06, 07, really, in the T20. By then it was like, right, this is good. Um, and, you know, the crowds were good. And as a young player, it was. It, I suppose maybe it was... As a young player, it was your way in. You, you'd probably get given a chance in that a bit quicker. So, um, yeah, but I, I think 2007, we had a hell of a team and we were taking it properly seriously and the crowds were big and it, it didn't take long. I think the first season, it was a bit of a giggle, maybe even the second, and then it, then it got serious. And then people started to, to take it real seriously and, and the overseas players came in who were specialists. Um, 
I mean, we were a brilliant one day side in that 2000, you know, 2003 to 10 kind of thing. So we were up there as well. So, yeah, I think it didn't take long to, for it to be proper serious. And, uh, and then I think it kind of, it's gone a bit full circle. It got um, quite formulaic, quite structured. And now it's, I think, has gone a bit more free and a bit more decision making. Yeah. It's definitely, I think it's evolved in many different ways. Um, you know, sometimes bowlers maybe got a bit theoried up and now they, now they do simpler things better. Um, and I think the biggest change I've seen was maybe even seven years ago, you would have one or two guys who played anchor roles. Yeah. And I think the anchor role is pretty much gone. Yeah. You I, know, think. I know. We just look at, we, we watched the IPL kind of religiously and we did a load of shows but it was twice a week when it was on. And just the abuse that people get if they have a strike rate of under 125. <laughs> oh, like, mate. KL Rahul hit what? 700, 800 runs in that tournament at 129. Quite, a lot, yeah. <laughs> and we, we were sitting there going, he's just a stat padder. Boring, mate. <laughs> Mate, you do, and and it has changed in that respect. I mean, I, in that quarter final this year, I think I got like eighteen or something, like twenty five balls. I genuinely, I was embarrassed. I was like, "What?" You know, the pitch. I mean, it was October the first. The pitch was shit, and we were chasing one twenty. I walked off, and I was like, "I think that's the end of me. Like, I am fucking useless." <laughs> and then, like, Morsey came up to me and said, "Oh, you know, fuck me. You played well. You just did a lot of fielders." But the pressure now is, yeah, it's a different game, and. We used to have two or three anchor guys, and now I mean the anchor role's gone. Mm-hmm. You look at the, that Notts team this year; it was it was nine hitters, yeah. Um, and that, I think that's as good a batting lineup as you'll see in, in any cricket around the world. I think um, it was just kept coming, and, and our, our thing was always to take the positive option. There wasn't any space for even if we're chasing one twenty, we wanted to do it in ten overs. So I think the game has changed in that. I think some sides have taken that on. Some sides still might play a bit more old fashioned depending on what players they've got. Yeah. So as someone who grew up without um w- w- when T20 wasn't a, a a professional thing. So in the in the the, the 90s or whatever, you wouldn't be aspiring to be a T20 player, you'd have maybe learn yeah. more traditional skills. How did you adapt your game as a professional to 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 be successful in that format? Um I think I always had it in me because I used to bat down the order. So I used to play a bit like that. Anyway, I wasn't a, 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 an opening batsman by trade and then had to adapt my game. I probably always played like that. The biggest thing for me in it, and this was something which I think I was really good at, was the mindset of of being prepared to do something for the team. And I, I remember it happened to me once or twice. And we'd play the first game. It happened at Sussex a lot where we'd play the first game and be a bit cagey. And then I remember one season, I, at the second game or something, I said, right, I'm going to run at the first four balls of the game. And honestly, I, I remember saying to Wrighty, we're having breakfast in the morning. I said, mate, I'm going to run at the first four balls. And, and funny enough, that actually became, I, I used to, <laughs> and I did it and I hit like three fours and we were off and running and it was freedom. And, and that was, a, I think that was a real good strength of mine in T20. The ability to, to take a risk first ball and not think about myself um, and, <clears throat> Me and Wright used to have a gig. I used to sit there and I used to tell him in the morning what I was going to do with my first ball like Thought or try. That. It was. No, honestly, you say that. But I used to say, right, I'm going to run at the first ball or I'm going to lap the first ball. Or, and I used to make a decision in the morning of the game what, I, what shot I was going to play to the first ball. And the freedom, and, and it was like this, this mental side of it that said, I am going to take a risk. Because if I hit that first ball for four or six... I bet you, you win the game We're just because immediately the you you literally the you know how many times you see a side they're two overs in and they're nudging around and they're four for none and then someone gets out and it snowballs into this shitty power play and I, I used to think well look if I get out first ball then look we're not for one nothing ventured but if I hit three fours in the first over we were enough ahead of the game to then and that the changing room would relax because you're off to a start. Um, yeah. And the amount of times me and Wrighty got going um, in that first... I mean, I did it when I, when I played for Knotts in the quarterfinal last year. I, I went out and said, funny enough, but as I walked out, Morsey said, what are you going to do first ball? And I said, oh, I'll probably um, come down the wicket. And then at the last minute, the off spin and Majib was bowling. Because I said, oh, you can't sweep Majib, he bowls too quick. And then I got down on my knee and swept it. And I was like, fuck, what have I done there? <laughs> but, but honestly, Morsey said to me, he said, when you hit that first ball for four, 
it was game over. <laughs> yeah, well, it's actually it's interesting that the, the, what you picked up on there. Um, Dan, we have a guy who comes on the show reasonably <clears throat> regularly. Um, his name's Dan. He's the analyst at Leicestershire um, and I think Birmingham Phoenix as well. And well, Dan his, West- yeah, Dan yeah. Weston. Yeah, his big thing is that the players who refuse to take risks early in a T20 innings are massively overvalued in, in T20 because you can't afford, as you say, to be four for none. Or four for one off two overs. It's then you're playing. Then you've got only you only got eighteen overs. You use ten percent of your overs to get nothing, basically. Um, yeah, I, I I agree. I think if you, as a player, I would say I won't lose you many games because I, I won't get three off seven balls and get out. That's not really what I do. And there's plenty of guys around that. You know, people like Phil Salt and stuff like that. You know, they go out and they they, they take their own stats or anything out of it and say I'm going to go early. And I think you'll have players around who might have good stats, but will lose games of cricket. Um, and, you know, I, I, would, I would probably say that I'm not going to lose you a game. I might not win it for you because I'll get out for four off three. But generally speaking, I won't lose you many yeah. games. I think if you look around at players like this, that Notch team this year, um, you know, Hales, me, Clarkey, like we all went from ball one and Clarkey this year. I mean, I've never seen anyone hit a cricket ball like that in my life. It was and the difference, the chalk and cheese difference between someone who went out with that freedom this year to maybe the year before, he didn't quite play the same way or wasn't playing as well or something. But this year, I would say, you know, he could very easily, if he plays like that, be one of the best T20 batters in the world very quickly. Um, and and it was a mentality switch because a lot of players have the ability, but yeah. the mentality and the selflessness to go out from ball one, I think is massive, which I think Dan would back up. So, so- yeah. Sorry, Ross, I was going to say, I mean, you you picked up Joe Clark and um, Phil Salt there, obviously a, a little bit younger than you, um, Chris. Yeah. Um, is it is it difficult playing with some of those players who've grown up learning the white ball skills? I mean, it must be a little bit of an arms race to some extent um, between different batsmen, particularly when, you, you know, when you're vying for contracts against um, the, the wider population of batsmen. Is it hard or are they noticeably better, some of the young players? They do different things um, that they can do things that some of us can't do. But that's the challenge. That's the challenge of, of us, you know, to evolve, whether it's, you know, discover new shots or change of what mode of playing. You see, I think the best players who play for a long time, I think anyone who plays for a long time has to evolve. Um, you know, you look at, take Daryl Mitchell, you know, he's an opening batsman. He's dogged, hardworking. And he's made himself into a T20 player as well, playing in a different role. So I think the best players who you you can't play a long time without being bloody good and also evolving because sometimes the position in a team isn't available. So you have to find a way to get in the team. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I've batted down the order in T20. um, I've batted everywhere. So you have to change your game to suit that. So would you take some of those lessons? Is there a kind of coaching on the horizon for you? Are you getting more involved in that? And would you take those um, lessons into that? I, I, look, I enjoyed the coaching. I did some with Durban Heat last winter. Um, I think I think for now, it, you know, it would be very much a, a part-time thing, um, you know, here and there. But it wasn't my ambition to go straight into, you know, county coaching and like that. Um, and over the last year as well, I think jobs have shrunk. You know, I thought the game was going to expand and now it's not. So there's less jobs than there were a year ago. Um and for me, I had to take, had to look at a, at a long-term option in terms of a career after cricket. So I had to kind of push that to the side. But yeah, you know, I would love to be involved and help out as and when. I think that my experiences would be good. So you, you talked about, and you talked quite positively of Peter Moores and the kind of experience you've mm. got with him through the years. What what makes him a good coach to you? What what what, what is the difference between what you had with Peter and some of the other coaches you've had? Um, I think that the key thing that I. I I suppose with all good coaches, that is, they care about your player. They they want you to be a better player for you. Um, yeah, I, I think I've worked with some really good coaches. You know, Gary, Kirsten, Morsey. They genuinely invest in you and want you to be a better player. Um, and I mean, Morsey's energy, Morsey's he gives you he gives himself to you, um, and you know that his only care is you, um, which is a really unselfish thing, which all good coaches have. I think um, Gary, Kirsten, the same. He committed fully to improving my game. Um, but, like, you know, I mean, going back to Morsey, he was just just a, just a bloody good bloke as well. You know, you could have a glass of wine with him. I, I, when I first signed for Knott's, actually, I, I went up to his went up to um, Knott's. I was staying in a crappy little hotel for a couple of nights. And um, he just said, look, come around for a cup of coffee. This was four in the afternoon. And I had fitness tests the next day. 
Um, so he sat there and he goes, do you want a glass of wine? And I was like, okay, yeah, go on. So anyway, two o'clock in the morning, we, I get to bed and I, I stay, I stay in his spare room and then I, I get up in the morning and he's off to the gym and I'm like, fuck, I'm screwed here. <laughs> and I had to go and do all my fitness testing. So I think the ability for a coach to be a human, Morsey, you know, he could always be a human, which was cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and just give give you everything you need to do um, to be a player. Not always give you the best information um, because sometimes they'll say something, whoever, however good a coach, it's not right. But Morsey would give you enough information, but then he would let you figure out for yourself. Um, uh, which was uh, Peter Moores, I have one instance. I actually I met Peter Moores in a Hilton hotel in the middle of Coventry. Nothing yeah. too, nothing too sordid. We were both working, <laughs> yeah. and uh, there was that bit where I think he had just been fired as England coach I think for the fir- for the first time, and it was that that bit. I just found it extremely shallow. He was completely, obviously, a lovely bloke, but then the stuff that you hear about him is that he got a bit of a bad press. I think from the England side of things, like he, he was never truly, I don't think, appreciated at that level. Um, is that is that fair to say, or is that a bit too far fetched? No, no. I think I think if you look at the players that that made that team, that I mean, that was the, you know obviously an amazing team. Um, you know, the team that won the World Cup recently, the team that were number one in the world. He he got a lot of those players in, and he developed them at, at an earlier level. So he almost he never got got the recognition he deserved there. I mean, that's for sure. And the way he dealt with the whole thing, I just think that's a measure of the man, the dignity um, he dealt with it. He's he's a special guy. I mean, he rang me two days ago. You know, I'm not I'm not on the not staff. Um, I'm not his priority. He rings me, how you doing? Um, and he, he's probably checked in with me every week since I've since I left after T20. So doesn't need to do that. But he, he cares about you as a person. So and I'm sure he does that to all players. Um, so he's you know how you doing? Sunday morning just says how you doing, and that that goes beyond cricket. That's that's where. I think people remember, you know, it's a bit with players. People remember good players and great players, but they generally remember how they were as a bloke and how they made them feel. So I'll look back and say Peter Moore's always made me feel special um, and I always felt better from speaking to him. So, yeah, that's as good as you can say, really. Uh, so we've got one final question for you, Chris. Uh, it's from Chris Brightwell. Um, he's a huge Sussex fan and a friend of the show. Um, <laughs> he asks, um, who are the best players or best characters that you've you've experienced over your career? Chris, that's a great question. Um, yeah, first of all, I, I hope you have a great Christmas. Um, and, and, look, I really appreciate you asking that exact question. Um, but... I think that is where, I think that is where county cricket is awesome for that. I mean, if I go back to who I played with and who become great mates, I mean, I suppose at Knox, you've got like someone like Luke Fletcher. He's just, everyone knows he's an absolute fucking legend. Um, and he tells some great stories about, I think, because he used to be, a, you know, he used to be a proper Forest fan. And he got, he got caught on CCTV spitting on the away fans and had to spend... I think two weeks cleaning the terraces at, um, at Nottingham Forest at the city ground. But like Fletch was a guy, so he would always make you laugh. And I remember I talked about it earlier when I left that ball off Steve. So I think as I walked out to bat, Mullaney's just left one. It's bowled in middle. And um, as he's walked in, I've walked past him. He's gone, right, Steve, it's quite hard to leave today. So I've looked to play most balls and play with the soft hands, keep the ball down. So I've gone, yeah, good shout, good shout. Anyway, first ball, I've played at one, missed it, and thought, oh, fucking hell, it's swinging a bit. So second ball is, is a way swinger. I've left it, and it's nipped back in and hit me on the back pad in front of middle and leg. So I've walked off, and the old bloke on top said, fucking hell, you're fucking useless. Yeah. Right, anyway, so I'm sitting in the changing room, and I've got Mullaney to my right, and I've got Fletcher sitting about 15 yards away from me with his head down. And I could just look at Fletch, and I'm there, and I'm like, oh, shit. Mullaney's kind of, kind of looking at me like, what the fuck have you just done? I told you not to leave it. And I just looked at Fletch and I just taken one look at him and his shoulders start to go. And I just took one look at him and I was like, two types of leave. And we have just wet up, no one else in the change room and we are pissing ourselves. <laughs> and I've just come in, I was a stinking few weeks. And I, but that was the kind of guy he was where we would just have absolute laughing fits at the most inane of things. I've just got out and we ended up having a giggle and, you know, I was pissed off, whatever, but it, it totally relieved the stress. Nice. Um, so like Fletch, Fletch was one of those guys who'd always just have a giggle with. Um, and then, you, you know, play with someone like Wrighty and me and Wrighty just, just used to bounce off each other 24-7. Um, he's going to play we, forever, we, isn't he? He's going to play till he's like <laughs> 60. Well, he looks like he's had Botox, but he's just got a really fat face. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
that was completely unrelated. He's just taken a shot. No, hey, <laughs> honestly, like we have a rule where we can just abuse the shit out of each other without, and, and there's no, you, nothing can be offensive to each other. <laughs> so, you know, I'll be in the change room calling him fat, this, whatever. And he would be calling me big nose, bald, whatever. And these young lads would be looking at the two senior players going, what the fuck is going on here? And I think they didn't quite know how to take it because me and him, I'd be abusing him for all sorts, you know, his private parts, his body, um, you name it. I was abusing him for it. I won't, I won't go down too many avenues there. <laughs> But, you know, I used to call him baboon nuts. Um, and the, the, honestly, honestly, some of the young lads, they didn't know what the hell I was talking about. And I think they, they didn't know quite know that the two senior players were going so hard at each other. Um, yeah. But so, I mean, that, that's where county cricket's unreal and that the friendships you build up um, and the people you meet around the world. Like, I mean, Grant, um, I mean, I'm just trying to think who. Grant Elliott. I have met him once in my life. Yet somehow we talk on message all the time. We speak all the time. We've just become these like Twitter stroke cricket friends. <laughs> but I've, only met, I've only met him once. Trent Woodhill, right? If you look through my Twitter feed, you'd think he's my best mate. <laughs> I've never met Trent Woodhill in my life. But somehow we've become mates. We text each other all the time. Um, <laughs> So you, you just have these weird connections with people and and it's it's quality because you meet these rogue people. I mean, Jason Lurie was one. Jason Lurie, um, obviously Sussex legend. And I was rooming with him at the Ramside Hall Hotel in Durham, which was in the middle of nowhere. It was like from the 1940s and it was a 595 carvery every night. So we used to get 17 pounds. 17 pounds we got in 1998 and we still got the same in 2020 every night. <laughs> So the Ramside Hall, you'd know you'd make a tenner every night um, on the carvery. So you'd go in and the carvery would be heaving. But anyway, middle of the season, um, me and Lurie are staying in the same in this room. Floral, floral um, duvet covers everything. And um, he just goes into the shower. I just hear this beard trimmer go. And he comes out and he goes in and he says, oh, Nashi, I feel like a fat cunt. And I was like, oh, fair enough. So he goes in and he comes out with his shirt off and he's just shaved his whole body. <laughs> And he was like, oh, everyone needs a mid-season body shave because you're feeling like a fat cunt and you just need to lose a stone. So I walked in and, and honestly, it was like something out, it was like something out of like, it was this, ye this yeti had been in there, <laughs> everywhere. There was hair everywhere. And he just said to me, go on, Nashi, you look a bit fat as well. Go and lose weight. So I've got in there and had a trim. And it's like every season now, midway through the season, Jason Lurie texts me, he's like... <laughs> Are you a fat cunt again? Is it time for your body trim? <laughs> um, and that's the kind of, they're the friendships that we get. And, you know, me and Jace haven't played together for 10 years. And he texted me the other day. He was like, oh, is that, is that the end of your body shaving days when you get fat in July? Um, so, yeah, that, that's the kind of stuff which makes county cricket fucking brilliant. And, you know, I've been lucky to do it for 20 years. Um, and it's fucking brilliant. And, and some of the mates you meet and you, you go and have a beer with them and it's like you, you saw them last week. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, you know, I've, I've, I've sat there, I've seen them falling asleep in changing rooms, being sick in changing rooms, um, you know, being sick everywhere. Yeah, stuff like that. It's just fucking brilliant. So, yeah, it, it's brilliant. And the people you meet, it's fucking awesome. Well, I think that's an absolutely brilliant way to, uh, to wrap up the show, really, Chris. I think um, it's weird that you might, end up getting catfished by someone pretending to be Trent Woodhill, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> if he asks you for money, don't send him any. Uh, the, good, the good thing is with Trent is that if I am being catfished, they're going to do well to be uglier than him because he's an ugly <laughs> fat Kiwi. So if, if someone wants to catfish me with, with Trent Woodhill, fucking good luck because he, yeah, yeah not enough said. Yeah. Uh, cheers, Chris. Thanks very much. Pleasure. No, absolutely. there with Chris Nash so thank you very much for him for joining um, that ultimately that wraps up the show uh, Max uh, we've got anything to um, final finalise here I mean the, uh, the 
Are we going back with like a power bottom move from the power surge at the top of the show? What, what are you going for? I, I, I just don't know what you want from me, Ross. That, well, that took that a, a turn, very didn't odd it? question. <laughs> that that took a turn. Um, you can find the cricket podcast on social media at the cricket pod. You can email the cricket podcast, the cricket pod at gmail dot com, and you can post stuff to Ross and his address. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, Power off. Yeah, yeah, um, uh, yeah, and and we want you to subscribe. Um, hit subscribe. We 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 we've been yo-yoing up and down the UK cricket podcast charts. Um, we want some stability, preferably in the top ten. We want. I think what we need to do is pick a podcast rival, and um, and give give, a, give our followers and, and subscribers something to aim for. Uh, but until we do that, just like make sure like two or three of your friends. Um, subscribe this week and we'll be very happy thank you very much for listening goodbye